I'm going to try to explain to you today why Alberta is such an exceptional and unique place. Some of you, and I certainly asked myself this question a while ago, <laughs> might be wondering why is it one party has ruled this province for more than 42 years. When I grew up, one party rule was associated with republics in the former Soviet Union. Others of you might be wondering, I live in the wealthiest jurisdiction, part of Canada, yet my government has recorded a deficit for five years in a row and cannot budget. Why is that? Others still might be thinking, why is the only solution for every political and economic problem the province seems to have boil down to the construction of another pipeline. And then others still might be thinking, <laughs> when we have the money, we seem to behave like these guys. <laughs> and when we don't have the money, we behave like this gal. And I assure you that is not Alison Redford in a blonde wig. So if you've asked these questions, as I have, and you're looking for an answer, um, I think I found one in a rather um, interesting political scientist from the United States. Her name is Terry Lynn Carl. She's from Stanford University. And she has studied the nature and character of petrostates for the last 30 years. In the 1970s, she went down to Venezuela. And she was going to do her master's thesis on OPEC. And the president of Venezuela at the time, Juan, Peron, uh, Juan Alfonso Perez, told her, I said, Terry, don't write about OPEC. Write about us. Write about what oil does to nation states and their governments and their people. And she said, I'll do that. And she found that petrostates are incredibly unique, incredibly dysfunctional, and share very, very many important characteristics. In particular, uh, they overspend. They undertax. They lose all notion of statecraft. They employ masses of foreign temporary workers. And they tend to concentrate, consolidate, and centralize power. Now, oil is a rather remarkable commodity, but it has two powerful properties. The first is this is the most lucrative commodity on the, on, on the planet. You know, a third of the world's primary energy is all provided by oil. So if you are sitting on a pile of hydrocarbons, you are sitting on a massive pile of cash. But there's a problem with this uh, uh, highly lucrative black gold. It is also the world's most volatile commodity. So if you're sitting on this pile and you're generating this cash, you will experience massive volatility in terms of revenue streams over time. The volatility of oil is increasing. It is not decreasing. As we begin to exploit more difficult, extreme, and ugly hydrocarbons from bitumen to shale oil, which all take more capital, more water, more money, larger footprints, we see increasing volatility in oil prices um, over time. Now, Terry Lynn Carl thought that each and every Petra state really resembled a plantation economy over time, where everything becomes subservient to the extraction of oil. It's a good image. It's a powerful image. And it's a disturbing image. Now, you're probably thinking, well, you know, we can't be a Petra state. But Petra states come in all sizes and shapes. They come with all sorts of different ideologies. You can have states that are democratic that are Petra states. You can have states that are incredibly autocratic, uh, like Libya and the former dictator of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. Um, you have everything in between there as well. So you have the ever charming Sarah Palin from Alaska. 
uh, a classic Petro politician. But along this continuum, you have all sorts of, of players and leaders and parties, right up to the Iron Man of Russia, Vladimir Putin. And Russia, don't forget, is the world's second largest exporter of hydrocarbons. So what's the first thing that happens in a petro state is your, the revenue effect. All right? So the dollars coming in really begin to change the metabolism of the whole political structure. And you really become a petro state at the point where more than your government earns more than 20% of its income from hydrocarbons. Louisiana, you know, is up around 30 to 40 percent, classic Petro state. Alaska, 90 percent of the state's income comes from um, oil and gas. Nigeria, 77 percent. Alberta, 30 percent. Now, what does Terry Lynn Carl have to say then? Well, Petro states rely on an unsustainable development trajectory fueled by an exhaustible resource, and the very returns produced by this resource, the piles of money, the flows of revenue, form an implacable barrier to change. And that's the classic trap for each and every Petro state. All right, so you've, got your, you've become addicted to the revenue. What do you do with this revenue? Well, you start lowering taxes. You want everyone in the petro state to feel warm and fuzzy about your new dependence on hydrocarbon revenue, and so you lower taxes. And you break, effectively, the link between taxation and representation and state accountability. And each and every petro state, to one degree or another, does this. We boast in Alberta about our low taxes, you know, no sales tax, you know, really low corporate taxes, and you know, that this is some kind of like tax-free haven. Good. Texas makes the same comment. Louisiana, Louisiana, the same thing. Wyoming, Alaska, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, all make the same boast. And then industry comes along and supports this and says, you know what, guys? Uh, in Alberta, a third of your hospitals and roads and schools are all funded from oil and gas activity. So you can't question what we're doing or how we're doing it uh, or why we're doing it. You're part of this compromise now that has been made because you're not paying for these services. Oil and gas activity is. And then you have this incredible volatility in revenue streams. In the middle of this graph, you see you know, ordinary places that are running off the sweat equity of ordinary citizens. Ontario and BC is an example. And you can see their fairly stable flows of revenue over time. And there's Alberta with the big black volatility mark all spelled out. We're either overspending, underspending, binging, expelling, whatever, trying to control the volatility. Now, if you're not being taxed, you're not really being represented. And one of the characteristics of Petro states is a great deal of political passivity, obedience, and loyalty over time. And we find in Alberta that engagement in the political process keeps on declining. This is a graph created by Brad Stelfox, by the way. So 60% of us are no longer engaged. We're not here to participate. We're here to make some money and leave. Another important aspect of Petro states is that they lose this thing called statecraft. When you start running on petrodollars, you think you can solve each and every problem by spending more money, or by concentrating and consolidating stuff. And Alberta is the perfect case of this phenomenon, where we have lost good quality statecraft in this province. Alberta Health Services, all right? 2008, we all remember, we had nine regional boards, the government thought, geez, we're having some issues here. Let's centralize. Let's make it bigger. You know, only in a Petro state would you somehow think that making something bigger is going to solve your problems, right? That's what we did. We came up with a super board, and guess what? Healthcare spending jumped from 36% of our budget to 41% as a consequence. Electricity deregulation was a colossal failure in this province, about which we had little discussion. And now we want to give $15 billion away to SNC-Lavalin, who's under investigation, which is under investigation for bribery scandals around the world. 
when in fact all of the best public interest information says we only need an upgrade of about five billion. Classic conundrum in a petro state. Last example here, Bill 2. Most of you might, might not have heard about this, but we, you know, we're not satisfied with our current energy regulatory arrangement. The government has stepped in again and says, you know what, we've got an idea, we're going to make it bigger. We're going to make a super energy board, and we're going to call it the Responsible Energy Development Act, and we're going to take a vice president, former vice president from Encana, and the guy who founded uh, the lobbyist group, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, and we're going to put him in charge of this organization. Not only that, in writing the act, we're going to take out this notion of public interest. You know, the mandate was at one time to develop resources in the public interest of all burdens. That phrase no longer appears, and as government officials explain to some folks, we don't know what the public interest is. The Dutch disease. You run on oil will inflate the value of your currency, and by inflating the value of your currency, other sectors in the economy will have difficulty making ends meet. This is now a very prominent situation, most uh, uh, observable in Ontario and in Quebec, our manufacturing centers, where we have lost 340,000 jobs over the last decade. The best economists say at least half of those job losses are due to our new petrocurrency and the rate of extraction and export of bitumen. Longevity. Why is it that petrostates seem to be ruled by one party, one dictator, one guy, one woman for such long periods of time? Well, when you're sitting on hydrocarbons and you have access to the money those hydrocarbons generate, you can extend your rule for a long time. The Democrats ran Texas for 90 friggin' years. The Republicans are now on, now they're on their binge. They've been running Texas for 30 years. Um, the PRI ruled Mexico on the basis of its oil wealth for 70 years. King Ralph was the third longest serving premier in Alberta. I mean, Alberta has like, you know, these long periods of extensive one-party rule. Margaret Thatcher, the longest reigning prime minister of England in the 20th century, more than 12 years, on the basis of what? On the extraction of oil from the North Sea. She did not save a dime. She used it to fund her political revolution. Hugo Chavez ruled more, nearly 14 years. He did not save a dime. He used the money to fund his political revolution in Venezuela. When do you ever see change in a petro state? There's just one window for opportunity, and that's when the price of oil falls. 2008, oil goes up to 140 bucks a barrel, crashes to 30 bucks a barrel. What happens? Unrest throughout North Africa and the Middle East. And in 2008, two new political parties appeared in Alberta, Wild Rose and the Alberta Party. It was not an accident. Transparency and secrecy. Petro states are famous for this. They don't want their citizens to talk too much about the money, how much is being saved, who's saving it, where, how is it being invested, what special interests might be involved. All of these issues become extremely clouded in petro states. Alberta is a classic case. Uh, uh, Peter Lougheed thought we should be saving 40% of all net revenues from our hydrocarbons. Under Ralph Klein, we fell to about 20%. We are now less than 10%. Our Auditor General, Fred Dunn, former Auditor General, said, you know, what's going on here? You're not, the government is not meeting its targets. It's leaving tens of billions of dollars on the table. It should be collecting this money and saving it for future generations. The response of the Alberta government was to say it was not the business of the Auditor General. In fact, they actually went this far. They said it is not democratic for the Auditor General to criticize the policies of the Alberta government. Norway. So is Norway different? Norway is cited as a petro state that somehow operates a little bit differently. It has to do with this fellow, Farouk Al-Kassim, and an accident 
of immigration. He married a Norwegian girl. They had a child with cerebral palsy. He shows up in Norway. At about the same time, the Norwegians discover oil in the North Sea. The Norwegians, a very prudent people, realize, geez, we know nothing about oil. We know lots about fish, but not oil. And so they hire the guy within four days. And what does Farouk al Qasim tell, them? tell them? Basically, two words of advice. He says, go slow, save the money. And on that basis, the Norwegian experience has been different. The Norwegians put 90% of their oil and gas revenue in a fund for future generations, and the Norwegian government runs on taxes. And because it runs on taxes, it must represent Norwegians, not the oil and gas industry. So what are some of the fundamental lessons here? Well, petrostates are first and foremost very different characters. They come, there's a long continuum of, that they occupy from democratic states to autocratic states. In fact, if you begin, if you find oil as a democracy, over time, oil will corrode many of your institutions. If you begin uh, oil as an autocracy, that oil over time will strengthen all of those autocratic uh, powers. So first and foremost, you need to take the money off the table. This is the source of the volatility. This is the source of the bad spending, and it must be saved for future generations. And it must be then replaced with representative taxation. Fair corporate taxes, a sales tax, fair income taxes, the same kind of taxation system you find in countries that do not have oil. And last but not least, I think uh, Peter Lougheed really put it best. He set out uh, um, a program for Alberta to follow. Not really one politician in this province has had the courage to, to do this. He said, behave like an owner. The resources belong to each and everyone in this room. Collect your fair share. Save for the rainy day. Do not run on this money. Add value to the resource. Go slow, one project at a time. And I would add to this a carbon tax, and let me end with one word from Terry Lynn Carl, and I, and I think this sums up the Alberta predicament. She said, it is much easier for a petro state to build a pipeline than it is to create and develop a representative government. Thank you.